Okay, so uh, as I said before, Ahlan wa Sahlan, everyone, greetings from uh, Dubai. Um, we are starting chapter uh, 15. Oh, it looks like the looks like there's a problem with the Toronto connection. Those of you who are watching online, just a moment. I'm going to try to reconnect. I will uh, just uh, welcome Leah, who's uh, who's signed in. Okay, ah, Toronto people, you're back. Excellent. Okay, uh, you guys can see me and hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay, so we're starting chapter 15. Um, now, we're not going to do the entire chapter. As I've mentioned the last uh, couple weeks, these chapters in Yeshua... Um, there's large, uh, large section of them, sh- large sections of them, that are very, very technical, um, that just describe the borders and the cities of the inheritance. And again, if regretfully, if we were sitting in the same room together, I could show you on a board, and we could actually trail the the border. And it's actually very, very interesting to see um, the degree to which these these descriptions in the psukim, to what degree they fit well with with uh, uh, areas that we can identify today and that's amazing thing it's an amazing uh, thing to do to be able to um, and we will we'll, we'll see soon uh, a little bit a few examples names of places that we that we recognize today um, be either either based on the geographical description to topographical description or the names of the locations themselves right so in some in some books they are um, there are maps that, that show the individual uh, settlements, s- settlement areas of the different tribes, but uh, it's difficult. You could find those uh, things of like that online if you're interested in seeing it in more depth. Um, we're going to skim over those, but go more to the individual stories that are in each chapter. Okay, so we are... Yes, you, you can, uh, Rabbi Spitz, I think it's kind of you can use like a share screen kind of uh, option where... Let's say you have something on the screen that you want to show us. Right. You can do it half screen or the full screen. You can just. Okay, I'll, I'll have to uh, I'll have to check that and see if I can figure that out. Um, okay. Maybe 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 it's worth it to do that uh, for one class. I'll I'll see if I can. Uh, just ask one of your kids. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're probably right. You're probably right, Paul. That's okay, fine. let's start chapter fifteen. Um, and a lot of the tribe of the children of, of Judah, according to their families, was to the border of Edom. Sorry, and not a lot, and the lot, right? Let's, let's just remind ourselves where we are as far as the context. Um, and that is uh, two chapters ago, we saw that the two and a half tribes, right, um, that were promised an inheritance on the eastern side of the Jordan, uh, of the Jordan River, uh, was promised them by Moshe uh, with the condition that they be at the forefront of the battle in, uh, um, when they cross the Jordan into the western side of the Jordan River. So we see two chapters ago that this promise, um, or this agreement was honored by uh, Joshua, by Yoshua. Last week, um, we saw the beginning of the inheritance of the tribe of Judah. Um, and we saw specifically the story of Kalev ben Yefune. Um, and we was we saw some, uh, I think, some eye-opening um, things about Kalev ben Yefune and how this, how what we saw last chapter reflects in a very different way. Um, it kind of makes us reread uh, the story of the twelve spies of the Miraglim in Sefer uh, um, back in Sefer Bamidbar. It makes us realize that Joshua actually was not as big of a hero as we may think in that story. And it's really Kalev ben Yefune who really was the one who led the charge, um, you know, to to throughout the complaints and uh, of the uh, of the ten uh, of the ten spies. And Joshua seemed to have just kind of joined in um, on Kalev's coattails. And because of that, Kalev uh, is is entitled, and he receives the uh, the city of Hebron. Okay, until here, everyone's with us. Okay, that was just a quick recap. So this week's uh, chapter picks up in detailing the borders and the exact cities um, of the of the uh, 
inheritance of the tribe of Yehuda. Okay, and the lot of the tribe of the children of Yehuda, according to their families, was to the border of Edom, to the wilderness of Tzin, southward at the uttermost part of the south. Okay, we're just going to read a little bit of these chap of these verses about the actual uh, geographical areas, and then we'll and then we'll skip a bit. And their south border was from the edge of the Salt Sea, right? That's Yam Melach, the Dead Sea, from the bay that faces southward. Okay, so, so from the southernmost edge of the Yam Melach, the Dead Sea, and it went to the south side of Malay Akrabim and passed along to Tzin and ascended onto the south side of Kadesh Barnea. So this basically goes all the way down south and passed along to Chetzon and went up uh, to Adar and circled to Karka. Okay. And from there it passed toward Atzmon and went to the river, river of Egypt and to the goings out of the boundary where uh, uh, we're at the sea. This shall be the southern boundary. Okay. Um, and the east border was the, was the, was the Salt Sea, right, Yom Melach, even to the end of the Jordan, and their border in the north quarter was from the Bay of the Sea at the uttermost part of the Jordan. Ha, huh. okay. At this point, we're going to skip. Okay, we're going to skip to verse 13. Okay, meaning what happens between verse 5 and verse 13 is then um, it goes and it starts describing, uh, meaning basically what it did until now, until verse 5, uh, verse 4, it's describing the southern border of, uh, of the tribe of, of Yehuda, which basically is the southern border of, of the land of Israel as we know it today, more or less. Um, and then it goes and it starts describing it's, uh, Judah's uh, um, northern border as it goes up into the mountain, to the Judean mountain, mountain, Judean hills. And then it says the following. <clears throat> verse 13, everyone with me? Okay, we're going to read these verses, and as usual, we're going to make observations and ask questions about these verses. And to Kalev, the son of Yefune, he gave a part among the children of Yehuda, according to the commandment of Hashem to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of the giants, which is Hebron. Okay, this is consistent with what we saw last week. And Kalev drew... Asked, so what? Together. I'm sorry? This is what Kalev asked. Sorry, this is what Kalev had asked Yeshua to give him based on Hashem's Right, meaning Kalev said to him, Hashem said that I will inherit, that I will merit, inherit um, the area that uh, where, where my feet, um, where my feet stepped. And therefore, I would like you at Arba, or Hebron. From this we understand, and that's how we explained last week, that's the origin of that Midrash, um, that when he came with the twelve with the Miraglim, he went to pray at the Merat uh, at the uh, okay, verse fourteen. And Kalev drove out, uh, drove drove out of there the three sons of the giant Sheshai, and Achiman and Talmai, the children of the giant. Okay, and he went up from there to the inhabitants of Dvir, and the name of Dvir before was Kiryat Sefer. And Kalev said, He who smites Kiryat Sefer and takes it, to him will I give Achsa, my daughter, for a wife. And Atniel, the son of Knaz, the brother of Kalev, took it, and he gave him Achsa, his daughter, for a wife. And it came to pass as she came to him that she persuaded him to ask of her father a field. And she leaned off the donkey. This is this should be changed to, and she fell, or she dropped. Okay, she dropped off the donkey, and Kalev said to her, um, "What is wanting to you, or you know, what's wrong? How is it translated by you guys?" What is wanting to you? Uh, we're using your text. Uh, Paul, what? Okay, it says, "What would thou?" Bay, old English. What wouldst thou have? Okay, Galia, what does it say in yours? In my what do you wish? What do you wish? Um, literally, in um, literally in the Hebrew, it's malach. Is I would translate it as what is for you, meaning what's wrong, or what happened. That that seems to be, and that also fits with the context more. And she said, verse nineteen, give me sustenance. But that's a bad translation. In Hebrew it says, Tnali bracha. 
Okay? And give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. For you have given me an arid land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Okay, then it goes on in verse 20. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah according to their families. And it goes until the end of the chapter to describe the individual cities. So, on, we're looking, we're focusing on verse, verses, uh, I guess, uh, 15 to 19. Questions, observations, comments. Um, it's a good question because Kalev is from that tribe. Wait, actually, is he from that tribe? Um, trying to think, is he actually from that? On the okay. No, I'm just talking. Okay, we're back on Facebook as well. Okay, uh, Galia, I'm, I'm, I'm. Since it's uh, one o'clock in the morning here, I'm a little bit out of focus, and therefore, I, I, I no, uh, Kalev ben Yefune. Yes, he is. Kalev ben Yefune is from the tribe of Judah. Therefore, your question is a good one. Say, so why do you have to specifically say Kalev ben Yefune inherited amongst the tribe of Yehuda? Of course, he inherited amongst the tribe of Yehuda. Um, let me just check something. Let's check. Let's just make sure that I'm that I'm remembering this correctly. Or if someone wants to open up in Sefer Bamidbar, open up uh, Parashat Shlach. Here, I'll I'll open up on uh, online as well while we. Here, let's see. I, I hate to Google things, but I just Googled it and it says Caleb is from the tribe of Yehuda. Yes, yes, that, uh, that that's what I thought. And Galia, you were right. So Galia's the question is a legitimate one. Why does it have to specifically say? Of course he's going to inherit uh, amongst the tribe of Yehuda. I'd say the, the, the only thing that comes to mind, I guess the simple answer that comes to that, like a, possibly maybe too simple of an answer, is to come and say that his inheritance wasn't a regular inheritance that, you know, arbitrarily different families got different areas, but the Kalev got a unique, a special inheritance amongst the tribe of Yehuda as we saw last week, because of the story of the spies. And also, Hebron and Kirat Agba are not, just, are not just random locations. They're locations of tremendous significance. That's where Merat is. That's where Avram and Sarah are buried. That's where uh, um, um, uh, Yitzchak and Drivka are buried. That's where Yaakov and Leah are buried. It's a significant portion. Okay, other questions, other observations? Uh, I'm sorry? No, not in the book of Yoshua. They, they did have that one in the war on the other side of the Jordan River before they crossed over when Moshe was still alive with Og Melech HaBashan um, and uh, Sichon Melech HaMori. But uh, this is the first place we've, account we've encountered it in the book of Joshua. Okay, maybe let's read the verses about uh, about. Uh, let's, let's. What? I'm still trying to work out the story of who gave who to who. And okay, so let's read it again. Let's read it again. Okay, and Kale uh, verse sixteen, and Kalev said, "He who smites Kiryat Sefer, and takes it, to him will I give Achsa my daughter for a wife." Okay. Let's stop here. Questions, observations, comments. Which one did you say? Fifteen. Uh, Sixteen. Probably it was a tough job. What? Probably it was a tough job to make. No. Uh, last week you said that uh, one of the reasons what you said that he wants this uh, city is that. I'm very strong, as I was 40 years ago. Excellent. And I can go to work, and I can go to war, and I can come back, and there is no problem. And suddenly he asks somebody, can you do it for me? Very good. I will give it. I agree. So, 
uh, one could argue that he wanted to see who would be up to the, who would be able to do it so that he could give his daughter in marriage. Like, I mean, it was a, so you say, so, so, to... wait, so you're saying it's not. <laughs> Paul, th- th- think about what he think about what he's saying. He's saying, "Listen, of course I could go and I can conquer the city, which would be the logical thing to do based on last week, but I have a different issue. It's, I really need to marry off my daughter. So let's think. Yeah. What's what's the best way I can marry my daughter off? Well, let's let's find a, let's find a champion. Let's find let's find a champion. Okay, okay. I can't I can't ref- I can't refute it." Refute the possibility, um, but no, but no, but 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 no, but if you look, but if you if if you look at the at the, if you look at the text itself, it looks the opposite, right? Look at verse fifteen. And he went from there to the inhabitants of Devir, and the name of Devir before was Kiryat Sefer, and Kalev said, "He who smites Kiryat Sefer, and takes it, he doesn't say he who would like to marry my daughter." Let him prove himself by... That's not what it says. He says, listen, okay. it basically looks like Galia says. It looks like he's saying, listen, I need someone to conquer the city. And in order to give motivation to conquer the city, I will... I promise to give that person... By the way, this is, this is not the only place we, we see this. We haven't reached it yet, but anyone familiar with a similar story in Tanakh? David, King oh, David da- yes, when, when Shaul was uh, too scared to go out and fight Goliath, and he tries to convince a champion to go out to face, uh, to face Goliath one-on-one, um, and through this uh, individual battle will be, the whole battle will be decided. One of the things he says, he says, he who goes out to fight against Goliath and beats him, I will give him my daughter. Right, and that that is one of the triggers um, to the whole dynamic between David and Shaul, because then David goes out, and he goes out without uh, without armor, and he goes, and then he marries the king's daughter, and that becomes one of those one of those one of those uh, stepping stones to replacing Shaul or to Shaul to feel challenged by David, right? So this was not, and the fact that the, this this appears again means that this wasn't an uncommon. To, I guess it wasn't an uncommon practice. I think we're also familiar with it from from general, from history, that this was a, a concept that someone who who proves themselves to be a military uh, victor, um, this uh, one of the spoils, one of the rewards that he gets from the king or from the general is to be able to marry. Uh, this is this is seen as a, a ticket into the uh, whether it's the aristocracy or whether it's into a higher higher. Uh, um, so, social uh, circle, um, right? Because you're married to the daughter of the. Okay, so it seems that, and then Galia's question, I think, is an excellent one, which is Kalev just gave us a long speech of how young and uh, you know full of life and vigor, and he's as strong now as he was back then, and he proved it by conquering a uh, Hebron, but then the moment. He goes to another city which is nearby, which is also within his inheritance. He says, uh, well, this I want someone else. Okay, let's continue. And Otmi- this is his problem. What? This is, sorry. What is the problem with this city? What, what, maybe something, maybe the name of the city says something to us. No, it's, it, it's just, it's a fortified city. At this point, all the battles, at this point, practically, all the battles they're fighting are being, are, are um, I mean, we saw in the first few chapters, first, first few battle chapters, we saw that the, the nations uh, were, were, were foolish enough to try to wage war against the, uh, the children of Israel out in the open, right? They gathered their armies and they tried to, uh, to fight us face on. And that failed completely because then they were beat on the field and then the cities were exposed. And then we went to the cities and destroyed them. At this point, they, although there was a reason for that, because the first battle of the book was against who? What city? The first battle of the book was against what, which city? No, that's the second. The first? 
Jericho. No, the, the first one was was Jericho. Jericho. Exactly, yes, Jericho. And they had and they had a wall. They had a big wall. And what happened to their wall? Came tumbling down. Came tumbling down. And then they and then they went to the eye, and the eye also was behind the wall. And through different tactics, they were able to draw them out of the wall. So at that point, they said uh, the the nation the, the other nation said, okay, let's just gain you know gain you know strength of numbers. They came together to try to attack. Didn't succeed at this point. They're just waiting behind the walls, and they're waiting because uh, uh, this you know no tactic is working. So the safest thing you could do is. Just hopefully hide behind your wall and uh, hope that uh, this invading army doesn't destroy you. Um, so there's no, I don't think there's anything specific about Kirat Sefer other than the fact it's a fortified city. Um, it needs to be conquered. needs to be, you know, uh, attacked, uh, uh, um, you know, face on, which is not a simple task to do. So, but we still have the question, why is Kalev not doing it himself? Okay, then let's, yes, Paul. One of the small point, I guess. Are these, this Othniel, is he his half brother? Because they say the son of. The so there's two options. The there's there's two. Op- Wait, we're not sure. There are two options. Either he is his half brother, meaning that they share, they come from the same mother, because they can't come from the same father, right? Look at their names. Okay. Kalev is Ben Yefune, and uh, and um, and uh, Othniel is Ben Knaz, the son of Knaz. So one option is to understand that they are half brothers; they share a mother. The other option is, low. If you look, there's another option that they're, that he's his nephew, right? And Otniel, the son of Knaz, the brother of Kalev, the brother of Kalev could either be on Otniel, or it could be on Knaz. Regardless of Torah, right, right, right. You, right. You guys see that? So, so it could be yeah. that Otniel is Knaz's nephew, which would make yeah. more sense as far as someone who is younger. Remember, at this point, Kalev is in his mid mid eighties. Although Galia, you're right. He said, "I'm as strong now as I was back then." It makes more sense that that Kalev that uh, that Otniel was probably his nephew. I said, from, the from, from, from the Pasuk itself, both readings are possible. That he is his half-brother, or that he is his nephew. Okay? And both marriages would be permitted. Yes, 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 yes. In both cases, yes. Even if uh, it is, it, yeah. Um, there are several examples where we see that an uncle marries their niece. Anyone? Can anyone think of, of the two famous examples? Ruth, no, Ruth, it's not her uncle. No, no, Esther. Oh, yes, correct, yes, Esther. Esther is one of them, no, yes. Another one is Av- Avraham and Sarah. But that's before the Torah. Yes, but I'm saying but Av- Avraham is uh, Sarah's uh, uncle. I think everything was uh, <laughs> almost, almost, not, almost, not uh, almost everything, yes. But, uh, um, but uh, yes. So there are a few examples, and 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 this is also something that we're familiar with from general culture. Um, you know, uh, um, many years ago of of marrying within within the family. Hopefully, not too closely within the family, but within the. You know the the second and, and third circles of the family, and also the phenomena of of an uncle marrying a niece, even though there's a big age difference. This is something that we know in in more of a tribal style living was something that was not uncommon, um, and the Torah does not seem to frown on it. Okay, so uh, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Kalev, took it, and he gave him right. So Kalev gave. Otniel achsa his daughter for a wife. Okay? So, and it, you know, I guess, again, if you're, if you're accustomed to the, uh, the Tanakh's writing and the way it thinks, this doesn't seem strange to you. Someone with, uh, 
modern sensitivity, sensitivities could have an issue with this, but that's probably because we're most of us, uh, uh, you know, kind of brainwashed by romantic style marriages versus uh, the way things were for many, many, many years, which is fixed fixed marriages based on, uh, uh, you know, family, based on uh, status, based on... Okay. Okay, now we come to the more... Uh, now we come to the more confusing part. And it came to pass... For someone who's just... Come, it's, so I was just going to suggest that as, as we go on, that for someone who seems you know, quite strong and being able to conquer this city was difficult to conquer, he seems a bit whippy as to... Ah, what, very yeah, good. Wait, you're talking about Kalev or about... Also, talking about Kalev or about Otniel? Otniel. Right. Like, I mean, she asked him to ask, and then as it turns, it looks like she's doing all the asking. Okay, so great, great. So one of the things that, uh, yes, I was going to point out that uh, you read verse 16, and I guess, you know, if, if, if I were a little bit more modern than I actually am, or, li- or, or more liberal than I actually am, I would take a slight offense with verse 16. Uh, you know, that, you know, that this is, that, uh, that she's being treated like a trophy. Um, not she's treated, she's, she's a trophy. She's a trophy for uh, this uh, this, uh, vic- this this soldier who goes and conquers a city, which means he's killing a bunch of people, and he wins as his trophy this woman. And uh, that yeah, maybe you, you could say, was she asked whether she wants to marry him? Right. We don't we don't see we don't see that. Where whereas by the way we do see instances like that in Tanakh, right? We do see well, let's say that Rivka was asked. Whether she would like to, you know, marry uh, Isaac. Whether she whether she wants to go with Isaac's slave, Avram's slave, to marry this person, right? And the Torah tells, tells specifically expresses that, says that, which means that the Torah seems uh, seems to put significance in in the uh, uh, in in the in the in the woman being, you know, it being consensual, which. Of course, it's it's very simple logic to us, but the fact that the Torah so brings that in great length in Rivka serves as kind of like a... Whereas over here, you know, A, she's being treated like a trophy, as if she's spoils for, uh, the, the you know, the, the, the soldier who who kills a bunch of people in a, in a war. And we see her as being... You know, no, one has, no one's asking her. She's, she's being treated like an object. Right? That's when you read verse 16... You know, one one could easily get that sense. Verse seventeen in Otniel, the son of Knaz. Wait, okay. Verse eighteen. And it came to pass as she came to him. Sorry, just a second. And it came to pass as she came to him that she persuaded him, meaning she persuaded her betrothed, I guess, to ask of her father a field. And she leaned, or she fell. Or she uh, dropped. And Paul and Galina and Galia, what do your translations say? What verb is used? She came down, she came down from her. Came down. Ooh, that's that's not a good translation. Galia, what does yours say? Uh, which one is I think when she came to him, she urged him to let her ask her father for a hill. Then she slipped from the donkey. She slipped? She slipped? So, um, so in Hebrew, in Hebrew, it's vatitznach, okay, vatitznach me'alachamol, which means either she fell or she dropped. I, I would translate it more as dropped, okay, meaning it seems something active. It's, it's not. It's not an accident. Okay, because you see, right? So, 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 Paul, I think you described it very accurately. She says to her betrothed, "Listen, Mister, go to my father and demand from him that he give us a different, different land or additional land." Okay, this is a yeah. so, uh, uh, and then, and then, obviously, and nothing happens. He doesn't listen to her, so she doesn't. Just stand back and say, "Okay, what does she do?" She's more active. She falls off the donkey. She creates. She creates. She creates drama. Her father rushes to her. Now we don't know what the exact scene is, but it seems to be like as she, as they're like, 
I guess, I don't know if this is right before the wedding, is this right after the wedding, it's some, somewhere in the process of the betrothment, okay? While it's still happening, or as it's, and she falls off the thing, her father rushes to her and says, you know, what's wrong? What's, what, what, you know, literally it's malach, what, what is it? You know, what's wrong? Why did you fall? Are you okay? You know, actually, what, you know, what's wrong? And then she says to him, and look at the phrasing. She's saying it as a command. Give me a blessing, for you have given me an arid land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her, look, and he gave her. It doesn't say, and he gave him, he or gave, they. what? Or even them. Right. He gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. So what has happened in this, in this, in this verse 18 and 19? Compared, to, the, what we, compared to, what, to what we read in verse 16 and 17, what has happened here between the roles of the individuals? What has changed? She's taken charge. His daughter seems to be wearing the pants, so to speak. <laughs> back then, sure ba- ba- no, back then, uh, chances are that women actually did wear pants and men wore dresses, actually. But uh, so you wouldn't be wrong about that. Um, so it's not, but it's not just that, so to say, maybe she wears the pants in the family, is that it's very clear here that she is not, meaning. In verse 16, 17, she is passive. She is not, not only is she passive, she's almost absent. She's, 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 uh, she's referred to almost as an object, right? Meaning she is not asked, she's, she's not asked anything, she, she doesn't say anything, she's... Right, she's she, she's almost not there as a as a as a personality, as a personality. She's not part of the story. There's only two sides to verse sixteen and seventeen, and that's uh, that's Kalev and uh, Othniel. She's like in the background. Okay, if you take it, I'll give it to you. And he took it. He took the city and he gave it to him. And then in verse seventeen and eighteen, sorry, verse um, eighteen and nineteen suddenly we discover that that is not the case. So either, either something has changed, she was, she was one way and then she changed, but I don't think it is. I think, um, and you look at Kalev, he goes from being very, very active in verse 16 and 17, going and fighting and conquering and achieving, in verse 18 and 19, suddenly he is the one who is only in the background, and he's out of the picture. He's not active in this, in this, in trying to get more, and in trying to pressure, either ask or pressure his uh, his father-in-law. Um, so, I don't know, what do you guys think? What what it, I think it's very clear that there's a big shift here, in 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 uh, the the emphasis and who on the and who's active and who's passive. How do we how do we understand this? What's going on here? Yes, Kalia. What I think is in the eighteen, the eighteen, there is one boy and one girl. What it, it, it looks like a satar to me. Um, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 like no, you're right. You, you're right. You're right. You're right. That that, that is actually a key word. Um, usually, the word. Lehasit comes from the the context of lehasit is to convince someone to do something, but in like you know in um, in a conniving way, uh, in some in in some uh, manipulative. Usually, the word lehasit has a context of manipulation in it. So what I think, what happened? It just she didn't want to do it. He made her do it. Wait. Maybe even... She, she didn't... Maybe she, even, wait, 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 wait. She didn't want to do what? 
she didn't want because she came to Panda and she just fell from the donkey. Maybe she was beaten. And father asked, what happened to you? Because later when we are reading, probably she is not coming back to her husband. And he wait, wait. Her. wait, wait, wait. But Tesitehu... She is the one who's doing no, the has. No, no, no! Wait, 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 Galia, Galia! But she, she is the one who's doing the hasata. But the sitehu, she convinced him. Okay, she tried to manipulate. It's not the, the word doesn't translate to manipulate. It translates to convince. But the context of con- of this of this verb is more like through trickery or through not direct persuasion, but some kind of roundabout way. She is trying to get her husband or her betrothed to demand and to receive more from her father. He, he, and we see nothing happens. And then she becomes active. But also, by the way, also it's interesting, she doesn't do it, she doesn't go up to her father directly and ask him or demand from him. She does some kind of act that causes her, that creates some kind of drama, creates some some kind of concern within her father, which then, you know, she's 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 using, I guess, different methods that she feels that will help her set up the scene to be able to achieve what she wants. But what's very interesting here, it's very clear. Oh, sorry, sorry. Before that, yes, more comments, more answers, more explanations. Uh, what? I think that she staged everything. She, she staged everything. She convinced, she wanted Ojeo to go to uh, step forward. She told to Korea. Based on what? You're saying, based on what? Uh, uh, but she, she is very active in the end. You're right, she's very active in the end, but we don't, but we don't see her active in the beginning. We don't see her. Yeah, maybe yeah, she no. was, but we don't see... We, we, there's nothing to indicate that she was involved in his decision to go and try to conquer the city to begin with. She doesn't appear in the story at that point yet. So... To come, but to, come, but to, to give uh, this uh, to go forward, to take her, to get her. But we don't see, we don't see her... We don't see her, her name doesn't even appear yet at that stage. She only appears once, you know, in, in Kalev's promise to whoever, whoever. I Meaning, if she would appear sometime before, and then, yes, Alex. Um, no, but it, it seems very bizarre, like, if you, like somebody said, before, said it's like a fairy tale. Like, this is an active army. You tell somebody, you do, you go conquer the city, you conquer the city. Why, why do you need to give that incentive? Like, because... No, that's, that, 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 that's a good question, but we have to remember something significant has changed in, um, in, the, in the structure of the wars. They went from being all-out wars with the whole, up until uh, two chapters ago, the entire nation went together to fight. But then Joshua was old in age, and the land remained, remained, you know, remained great to be inherited. The two and a half tribes head back to the to Jordan, and then Joshua comes, and in these chapters he's defining each tribe, what land is is they're entitled to, and then that tribe has to go and conquer their area. So it's not an all-out war, and they don't even necessarily even every tribe might not even necessarily have. We'll see later on, but not every tribe necessarily has a unified formulated army in this case it's Kalev who personally was given a certain small area or in Hebron and around Hebron which also includes the city of Kiryat Sefer so it is his problem you know problem so to say he is the one listen this city is within the land that you were given okay you need to go and conquer it so Kalev, maybe maybe he's wealthy. Maybe he has soldiers. Maybe he goes and he makes a, makes a, or makes gets other people to join. And then he says, "You join me, and I'll join you." We'll see that later on. With some of the tribes decide to join together to fight together, uh, in order to gain you know land. Each one, each uh, each tribe's land. 
Um, in this case, Kalev says, um, okay, you know, I, he's asking for someone else to come and help him. Maybe he needs more soldiers. Maybe his soldiers are tired already. Maybe there's something else going on. But it's not an all-out war. And no one there is obligated to, to, uh, um, um, to conquer his city. It's his city. It's his city. It's supposed to be part of, part of his inheritance. Now, yes, the tribe, meaning the entire tribe of Yehuda, is obligated to conquer the entire boundaries of Yehuda. And the same thing is true for all the tribes. But it doesn't mean that every individual person has the, has, has the personal obligation to go and conquer all the cities. Yes, Paul? I, I'm just, you seem to be focusing on this apparent change of uh, the daughter, Aksa, from how she was originally. But... Um, when we're introduced to her, I'm not sure that her role is meant to be active. I mean, she's just put there as, um, as you know, the outcome of this. I'm still struck by what seems to be a change in Adniel, that he was very forceful, he did what he had to do, and now he doesn't even answer her and doesn't carry forward any of what she's asking, and she has to take charge. Like, it just seems like something's changed more in him, that you'd think that if he was able so, to conquer a city, he'd be so, able to ask. Right, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that there's a change. Option one is to say that there's some dramatic change in the reversal of their, of their personalities. The other option is to come and say, no, no, no. Um, um, uh, um, that, 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 that they're consistent. Meaning, what I mean, this, this is a thought that I have. It's not fully formulated, but so I'm sharing it with you in its, uh, in its raw form. That... Our, our assumption is um, that if in verse 16, 17, if, she, if a woman is being offered up by her father as a reward for conquering a city, then that is uh, either degrading or that, that is, or that we would expect her to have something to say about it. Um, and that if she doesn't, therefore she must be a submissive and weak personality. That's kind of like our, I think, our, our base assumption in that type of, if, if someone were to, if this were happen today, we would all say, wow, this is someone, this is a very submissive and weak personality, very submissive woman to the patriarchy of her family, of the tribe that she lives in. That's how I think we would see it today. And, then, and therefore, it would be very strange for us if the moment after she got married, or as she's betrothed, she's suddenly telling her husband what to do, and then she's and then she's telling her father what she expects to receive from him. So therefore, for us today, these two things wouldn't they, they really wouldn't sit together. And therefore, we would say, oh, something dramatic must have must have changed. Um, another option, as I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, um, is that um, she was perfectly okay with it. She saw it as something which is meaning uh, with, with with being offered as. Because why wouldn't she want to marry someone who's a hero? Someone who volunteers, someone who volunteers to head the army of her father to expand the boundary of her family's territory? Why wouldn't she be excited? Why wouldn't she want to be offered to, to a man like that? We'll see. We'll, we will see later on, I'm giving you a, uh, a spoiler alert here, the first shofet, the first judge in the book of Judges, will be Otni Elben Knaz. He's actually going to be the next leader. After Joshua, he ends up taking over. Not Kalev. Otniel is the next one. So we're getting a bit of a... We're getting a kind of like a... We're getting a first glance at something that later on will, will become a much bigger, much much more significant. Okay, so I kind of spoiled it for you. Um, and I think Otniel maybe is so I think so I think so she when it comes to she has no issue why why wouldn't she want to be married to someone to a star officer who volunteers for the sake of her family and of course for the sake of the tribe but also to her personal family why wouldn't she why why even, I mean, it, meaning it almost but, sounds like what some of these people, sorry uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. So I just want to continue the thought. Then, Paul, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, um, but and the, but 
and I think this is uh, um, right. there's another question, which maybe right, I forgot to, to we forgot to ask, which is these chapters, and the following chapters, they're dealing with the inheritance of the tribes. One could wonder why this story appears here at all. Why? Why at all? What, what, what is the significance of telling me that? Uh, so maybe you have to tell me that Otni Elben Knaz volunteered because uh, you know we're going to meet him later on, and therefore it's significant to know that uh, that he volunteered and he was a emerging uh, uh, personality in the tribe of of Yehuda, the tribe of Judah, as we know, is a central tribe, you know, throughout all of history. But what is significant about this whole story about Achsa? Why, why, why is it needed? Okay, it's, it's kind of interesting, and it's going to lead us to some interesting discussions about, you know, the reversal in how her personality is portrayed, what she cares about, she doesn't care about, she doesn't seem to care about being promised to, to a, 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 a promising officer who eventually is going to be one of the next leaders. Okay, maybe she understood this, maybe she detected this in him, so she has no problem as being, as being part of the ability of her family to, t- to inherit a larger piece of land. But then when it comes to her own personal family and what they're going to receive, she says, I want to make sure that we receive what, what we need. And the truth is, and this might sound, and, and, and I'm, I, I am very much, maybe I'm opening myself up here to a big argument, but I think this 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 fits with uh, um, that uh, you know that 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 Avram Avinu um, was you know uh, uh, had his had his head in the high big ideals of you know he's going to sit outside in the heat and and bring in three strangers at the end of the day who's the one who actually has to make sure that the house is running Sarah she's yeah. the one who has to cook, and she's the one who sends the boy to go get, and so on and so forth. And then we see, we see a similar thing with Yitzchak, that he, um, that he had his, high, his head up, uh, high up in the sky as far as the ideals, and yes, I'm going to bless Esav, and, and, and Esav, I'm going to turn him into being good. And Rivka is the one who's much more realistic, understanding what's actually happening in, in the house, what, what the correct way to do, and she goes, goes about and makes sure and by the way, there's actually a few similarities with Rivka. Yes, I think by coming up the donkey. Yes. With Rivka coming yes. Up the donkey. Yes. 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 But it was, it was a different kind of coming up. I think she was in awe when she came off the donkey, as opposed to using it as a tactic to get what she wants. You you you're correct. Over there, it seems to be something that happened to her, and not that she did. Okay, but um, the fact that whenever the Torah Tanakh uses a word that is similar, or uses a a, a, a a theme which is similar, it's usually trying to connect us to the, trying to connect us back. It's trying to say, there's something about these personalities which is similar. And definitely, definitely, when you think about Rivka, and the fact that she absolutely was, uh, and by the way, and, and, and by the way, over there, over there also, uh, you know, she was being given, right? She was being given as a as a young as a as a as a child or as a or as a teenager as a young teen. She was being given by her by her family to someone else, right? And in, in, in exchange for gold and, and treasures and whatever. Um, so there, there is, but we see. I think we can find this other similarity, just like Rivka, who we know was was uh, uh, very, very active, extremely active, much more so than Yitzchak, and had a better understanding of the, of the, of the reality, the day-to-day life, and with the, and with the, uh, the, the chutzpah, so to say, almost, to make sure that it happens. And this seems to be happening over here as well. Yes, Galia. Maybe I'm mistaken, but here I see something new. Before it was Kaka, but now by the question, because they got piece of naked. In naked there is no water, and they understand that they have to work land, and to work land without water, you can't do this. Right. So what's new here? 
now it's the different kind of thinking. Okay, we got land, now we have to work this land. Yeah, and it very much could be that Otniel, he's, he's more of a, maybe, possibly, he's more of a military, military mind. That's what he's busy with. That's the way he's thinking. And she seems to be a lot more understanding of the reality and says, okay, it's very nice that we got this city, that you, that you conquered this city and, you, and, 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 you, and we got this area, but okay, but we're going to have to work it. And, we, and if we don't have water... Um, um, and I think it's almost like, you know, one could wonder, why does she drop for the donkey? You know, because it's like, oh, you're so concerned for me. Really? You're so concerned? How can you give me arid land? What's the point? What, what is the... You, you're concerned for my welfare? Then give me something I could work with. Again, not me, achsa. Me, me and my husband and all the children. I mean, this is... Remember, this is an inheritance that is going to be for generations. These families, the area that they are getting, is going to be theirs for generations upon generations. And remember, every fifty years, the land goes back to them. It is their land for for millennia. That's a long time. And she has this understanding of the significance of 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 getting the land and making sure that the that that it can be worked and can be. And, and this gives us a very different picture of just because uh, the uh, women are portrayed in Tanakh in some areas as being passive, it is not necessarily because they were weak or because they were submissive. Not at all. It's because, in this case, I think, because there was an understanding of, the, meaning they willingly agreed to the structure and to the ideals that were reflected through these behaviors and when and, and when they disagreed or when they understood it to be differently, then they were, there was no no uh, inability on their part to act on it, and no uh, and and she's not rebuked by her husband or by or by her father, or she's not seeing she's not seen negatively at all. Quite the opposite, I think she's being heroed here. And if we go back to the question of why in the context of this whole chapter, which is talking about the tribe and the inheritance of the tribe, do we need the story at all? Um, I think the answer to that is, is because it is very easy to lose sight of the individuals when the nation is so busy with such big things. The nation is conquering the land. The tribes are finally getting their inheritance. Each family is... And, and like history is being made here and, 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 and whatever land you settle now is yours for generations, for millennia you're right for your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren and this is like, that's it this is everything we've been waiting for, for you know, since we left Egypt and since the beginning of Joshua and all these big, tremendous events are taking place and I think we'll see practically every chapter there's going to be a little story it's going to say, don't lose sight that within the collective of the Jewish people, the nation, and the collective of the tribe, don't lose sight of what? Of the individuals. And I think that specifically, if you want to say don't lose sight of the individual, it's the best probably to prove this point is to go with the members of society that otherwise we would have been it would otherwise we would it would have been easiest to ignore. It would be easiest to ignore a woman at the time. And therefore, and we'll see it again, we'll see it later on with B'not Slavchad. The B'not Slavchad show up again. So therefore nice. you can say, not only is, 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 is the, the individual is significant, and every individual is significant, and so much so that, look, what, she, what this individual was able to, to, uh, to realize and achieve in the context of, while the whole nation's conquering the whole land and the whole tribe is inheriting the whole land, don't lose sight of the individual as part of the collective. I think it's, I think it's a very, very neat way to, to uh, uh, have a very, very, very smart, very cool way of how it takes her, uh, 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 depicts her in a way that we kind of assume, oh yeah, that's how Tanakh depicts the wo- a woman. And suddenly it's like, zhup, she like kind of like teaches everyone a lesson, and uh, and everyone says, "Oh yeah, 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 she's right, she's right, yes." 
can I ask a question? I don't understand that at all. Do you also have a like, project to the Poker the Lab? I'm sorry, say again? Especially the felt at this moment in the ring. Do you want to conquer the land? 